This is the fifth in a series of lectures for MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork in Algebra. In this lecture, we'll start thinking about polynomials. We'll be looking at polynomials in one variable only for quite a while. Um, uh, we could allow our coefficients and our polynomials uh, to, to be drawn from uh, the integers or from the rational numbers or from the real numbers or from the complex numbers uh, or of course we could also allow them to be um, remainders modulo some uh, fixed uh, fixed positive integer that last case is not as as familiar let's see what it looks like um, if we'll work for example with uh, coefficients that are um, that are remainders mod 2 a particularly important case, um, then the only remainders mod 2 are, what's well, sorry, little bars on them in our somewhat sloppy notation, um, uh, 0 bar and 1 bar, the, or 0 and 1 if you prefer. Um, so those are the only possibilities. So what polynomials could there be in some variable? Let's make a variable called x. Then what are the possible polynomials? Well, 0 polynomial, and the constant 1 polynomial, constant 0, constant 1. We could have something like a 1x which we can just write, of course, as x. We could have things like x plus 1. Uh, we could have, well, maybe a little bar on it if I want to remember that it's a remainder. x squared, x cubed, things like x plus x squared, x plus x cubed. But uh, you can't have a 2 or a 3 or anything else because, of course, those would, uh, we're only allowed remainders mod 2. Those would uh, simplify to become either a 0 bar or 1 bar. They'd simplify mod 2. So when we think about it uh, from that point of view, then um, uh, when we work with these polynomials that are uh, that, that have coefficients that are remainders, we have some strange behavior. Um, the first strange thing that occurs is that if you look at something like x cubed plus x cubed, of course that should be 2 x cubed. But 2 really should be a remainder, in this case mod 2. Again, we're working with remainders mod 2 as our coefficients. And so when we work with these polynomials, we'll add uh, the, by adding the remainders, the, the coefficient remainders, multiply by multiplying remainders, and so on and so forth. So using ordinary remainder addition, remainder multiplication, um, which we know is given by ordinary multiplication, or addition of multiplication, but then afterwards we take the remainder. But of course, 2, uh, when we're working mod 2, is 0. And that means there's no x cubed. So in other words, that's just a 0 polynomial. So that's a bit surprising that you could add two non-zero polynomials like this and they'd cancel each other out in a, in a surprising way. Um, it means, however, that a lot of the manipulations are actually much simpler than they would be with integers because there's lots of, lot more opportunity for things to cancel. Um, so that's one form of strange behavior, but it's not the only one. Um, we can have an even stranger uh, phenomenon, which we need to keep uh, keep our eye on. Um, Consider the simple example of a polynomial p of x is x plus x squared. Now, I want to say, and again, we're working with coefficients, which are remainders mod 2. But I, I want to say this is obviously not the zero polynomial, because it has a, a 1. We can think that of that as the 1 uh, coefficient here, and there's a coefficient of 1 here, 1x one and 1x one squared. So it has non-zero coefficients. And so it's not the zero polynomial. It's not the zero polynomial. That's, uh, that's important. It's, it's certainly not zero, because it has non-zero coefficients. But if you think of it as a function, it is the zero function, or it shouldn't say is, maybe it represents the zero function. If you think of what function it gives, is maybe I should put it in quotes because we're not going to say that it's not really the, not not really zero. It's a non-zero polynomial. But if you think of it as a function and you plug in 
that x is 0, you get p of 0 is what? 0 plus 0 squared is 0 plus 0 is 0. And then uh, if you plug in x as 1 instead, you get p of 1 is 1 plus 1 squared. 1 plus 1 squared is 1. And then 1 plus 1 is 2, which is 0. So you can see that this function, again in our sort of sloppy notation where we're writing our remainders as 0 with a bar on top and 1 with a bar on top, to remember that's the remainder of 0, remainder of 1. Um, this function computes out 0 when you plug in x is 0 and 0 when you plug in x is 1. So those are the only things you can plug in because they're the only numbers we have when we work with remainders mod 2. Those are the only remainders we've got. And you plugged in both of them and got 0. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't look very good. It looks as if this function is a 0 function. So p of x equals x plus x squared, we could say represents the 0 function. But it's not the zero polynomial. So that means we need to think of polynomials as something different from functions. We used to think when we worked with real valued polynomials or complex valued ones that we were talking about functions. But we're now saying they're not really functions anymore. They're just formal expressions with, sim with this symbol x. There's a formal symbol called x, and we write down expressions in terms of it that involve powers of x and various coefficients in front. But we don't think of them as functions. We think of them just as formal expressions. We have to make that distinction carefully when we think about polynomials over remainders with remainder coefficients. Of course, we know how to add, subtract, and multiply um, uh, polynomials in the obvious way by adding sub and subtracting uh, their coefficients, and then by expanding out to, to do the multiplication and adding powers of x in the obvious way. So these are all more or less obvious. What's not so obvious is how do we divide. And we have the same problem we ran into with integers, that we have to have a remainder sometimes. We have to have a quotient and a remainder. I'm not going to go into any detail about how you do the division. Um, so I'll let you recall uh, long division. of polynomials. on your own. And the reason I'm doing that, one of the reasons at least, is that um, as with long division of integers, it's done differently in different parts of the world. If you look at the Wikipedia entry on long division, you'll find all kinds of different techniques for writing out long divisions. And some of them are really very different. So I'll let you do this on your own. Um, remember how to do long division of polynomials. I won't do it in front of you. So um, I'll just write out answers. For example, if I try to take um, x to the fourth minus 3x plus 5, and I try to divide into it x minus 4 um, into that, how many times does it go in, so to speak? Um, then we get uh, x to the fourth minus 3x plus 5 is. And again, I'll let you work out how to do the long division, the details. I'll just give the answer. Um, so x cubed plus 4x squared plus 16x plus 61 times x minus 4 plus a remainder of 249. And the remainder could in general be a polynomial. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be, in this case it happens to be a constant, but it could have been any polynomial. And oh, by the way, maybe I, should, maybe I should say in this example, we're working over the, um, in this example, here we are, um, we're working over uh, rational numbers, let's say, as coefficients. Let's see, so coefficients are rational, uh, or integer, it doesn't matter. But um, in, when you do long division, we should be a bit careful, it doesn't really work so well with integers. In this example, it turned out that everything was integer. But in some simple examples, even if you start with integer polynomials, in the process of the long division, you do have to sometimes divide. Um, so that's a bit dangerous. You start with integer polynomials, you end up with only rational polynomials as in the answer sometimes. So you have to be a bit careful. You can't really do long division of integer polynomials and get an integer answer in general. I should also point out that the uh, the remainder um, the remainder here um, has uh, the special property that its um, its degree is less than the degree um, of the uh, the polynomial we divided in. divided in. Um, 
Um, and that's important because with integers, when we divided, we got a remainder which was smaller than the thing, smaller in absolute value, than the thing we were dividing by. It was a smaller number. But now we're not dealing with numbers, now we're dealing with polynomials. So we don't have a notion of smaller polynomials, we only have a notion of smaller degree polynomials. And so this guy has smaller degree, it's degree, it's degree zero, it's smaller than the x minus four degree, degree one that we divided in. So you could see it had to be a constant because we were dividing in a linear and the remainder has to be smaller in degree. This is linear, degree one, so this has to be constant degree zero. As I said already, we can't really do this with integers, but we can do it with other things. Uh, what can we do it with? We have to think about um, the, the rules about coefficients. Um, what kind of rules would we have to have? Well, to divide um, uh, some polynomial b of x by some polynomial c of x, in the process of the, of the calculations, you ha often have to divide uh, divide uh, coefficients by coefficients. So well, it may turn out, like it did in our previous example, that just by accident, when you start with a purely integer coefficient problem, it may turn out that you end up with an integer coefficient answer. It doesn't always work. And so to guarantee that we can always do this, we'll have to make sure that we, that we can divide. Um, so uh, we will only use um, use coefficients where we can divide, where we can, let's say, always divide. We don't have to worry about whether or not division is going to be available. Um, so in other words, we need there to be reciprocals. And um, what about uh, if we were to do um, with remainder coefficients, if the coefficients are remainders? Um, well, we discovered that it doesn't work for, let's say, remainders mod 6 mod 6, for example, you can take a look at them and see what you can divide and what you can't divide. Which objects have reciprocals? Which of them have reciprocals and which don't? And um, So it's a nice example to work out. 6 is a fairly small example where you can get some, uh, some simple, um, some simple uh, examples of, of, of uh, remainders that don't have reciprocals. So we want to work with, with remainders which do. Well, how can we see if something will always have reciprocals? If there's some remainder, if we do work with the remainders mod some number, how do we know if we always have reciprocals? We know that in order to have a reciprocal, um, we need that the greatest common divisor of the, the remainder and the number we're working modulo has to be 1. So the, this exists if and only if the GCD is 1. And if we want everybody to have, every non-zero remainder to have a reciprocal, we want 0, 1, 2, all the way to m minus 1, to all have reciprocals uh, defined modulo m, um, then how would that happen? Well, we'd need the GCD, sorry, not 0, but 1, 2, and so on up to m minus 1, uh, to all have reciprocals. We'd need, of course, that the GCD of 1 and 2 and m minus 1, well, the GCD of 1 and m, and the GCD of da da dot GCD of uh, m minus 1 and m would all have to be equal to 1. Um, they'd all have to be, oh, sorry, that's 1 and m, not very well written. Um, so so all those GCDs would have to be 1. So the GCD of, of m and any of these things would have to be 1. And that can only happen if m is prime. That's exactly saying that m is prime because we're saying that it has to be co-prime to all smaller numbers. And there are no common divisors with any smaller numbers. So exactly when it's prime. And so that's why, from now on, um, we'll only work with, because we want to work with polynomials and use division, now on we'll only uh, work with remainders modulo a prime. And there'll always be remainders mod p for some prime p. That'll ensure that we never get stuck in the middle of a computation trying to divide by something and finding we don't have the ability to divide by it. It doesn't have a reciprocal. So, um, so we'll never get into trouble as long as we make sure whenever we work with remainders, there will only be remainders modulo prime, not modulo any other kind of number. Now, w if we do that, then we can actually uh, calculate using our standard formulas. We can calculate uh, uh, GCDs of polynomials as usual. Um, using exactly the same formulas that we did for um, for integers. 
we can we can take quotients and remainders and by the, in the same way we can reduce the calculation down and get the GCDs. Um, so we we saw uh, how to do that for integers, but also we can use the same trick for doing bazoo coefficients. We can calculate bazoo coefficient coefficients of uh, of polynomials um, using exactly the same trick. Let's just see how to do it in an example. Um, because of course bazoo coefficient calculation automatically gives you GCD, so we might as well just do that. So if we take b of x to be uh, 3 plus 2x minus x squared and c of x to be 12 minus x minus x squared and we'll assume here that we're working with rational uh, coefficients. Again, we have to work with can't be well, allow ourselves just to work with integer in general because we may have to compute with rational numbers in the middle of the calculations. Even though we have integer coefficients showing up here, the calculations in the middle will have only rational numbers in them. We'll have some rational numbers in them. So what do we do to calculate bazoo coefficients? It's the same as it was for integers. We put 1, 0, 0, 1, b of x, c of x into a matrix. So 1, 0, 0, 1, 3 plus 2x minus x squared and 12 minus x minus x squared. At this point, you could uh, subtract either row from the other. It doesn't really matter. Let's just take um, minus 1 of this row to this row. Um, and we'll see uh, that that's, we're doing that in order to cancel out the, this x squared. We want to get rid of the biggest power of x we can. We're trying to go down in degree. Um, so we use this x squared to cancel this one. So minus this row to this row, and we get 1 minus 1 and uh, minus 9 plus 3x. And then the second row stays the same. Um, and now uh, the problem is to get, get rid of this guy, which is the bigger uh, degree. So we have to somehow kill that. And so what we're going to do is to use this x here to kill this x here. And so we have to multiply by x over 3. And now you begin to see we really can't avoid rational numbers showing up. We're ending up with, with, with denominators. But the powers of x are always positive powers. We don't have to divide by x's ever. We don't allow ourselves to divide by x's. We're working in polynomials in x. So when we add a multiple of a row to another row, it's a polynomial multiple. It has to be polynomial in x, but it has rational coefficients. So the next step we have is um, uh, we get uh, 1 minus 1, the first row doesn't change. And then the second row has now become x over 3. 1 minus x over 3. So 3, 1 minus x over 3. And then um, 1 minus 4x. And then um, we can um, try to get rid of this 4x by for example, now at this point you could uh, I'd use either one, either row to get rid of something from the other. We've got degree 1 and x in both of them. We've got to try to get the down in degree, so what we'll do is just add uh, 4 thirds of this to this, and um, uh, so we'll get um, uh, minus, let's see, where are we? So um, if I've got this right, then we're getting um, 1, it's 4 thirds plus x over 3, minus 1 third minus x over 3. This is still minus 1 minus 9 plus 3x. And then this guy becomes uh, 0, according to my calculation. Ah, sorry, this is this is 12 here. Um, that's why that works. OK, so, so we get 0 here. And then because there's a 0 here, you can see the 0 here. That means we're done. And we're now on to saying that this must be our row of bazoo coefficients and GCD. So the bazoo coefficients are the 1, the minus 1, and that's the GCD. And so we get a final answer that says that 1 times this polynomial b of x minus 1 times the polynomial c of x. Uh, is equal to minus 9 plus 3x, which is the GCD. So we can do bazoo coefficient calculations almost exactly the same way as we did for integers, but instead of thinking about trying to get a big integer uh, to, to be divided by a smaller one, what we do is try and get the big degree to be killed off by the smaller one. Um, so at each stage, the degrees go down, 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 and so we're guaranteed that this thing stops. We're insisting that we're only allowing ourselves to use certain sorts of coefficients, and there's a, a, a term for that a field 
um, if we uh, we choose which of the following coefficients to use when we work with polynomials, a choice of coefficients of coefficients being we're allowing all the coefficients to be either rational numbers or we're allowing them to be real numbers or allowing them to be complex numbers the set of all complex numbers right is always allowed any complex numbers or we're allowing the coefficients to be remainders modulo some prime and you get to pick which prime and then once you pick that prime you have to do all your calculations for all with all your coefficients of all the polynomials with the same prime uh, modulo the same prime okay and we'll say that this is the choice of a field a choice of a field. So this is which field we're working over. This field, this field, this field, or this field, or well, these fields. When we work with a polynomial, and we're working over a field, again, it's always going to be over a field, um, a polynomial P of X is said to be irreducible um, if it is not of the form A of X times B of X, where um, uh, with coefficients in some field, and again, we're not uh, both of a and a and x and b of x are constant. This is the appropriate notion of something like a prime number. Under the following big theorem, which says that over any field, once we start, we pick our field to work over, um, any uh, polynomial in one variable. Uh, factors into irreducibles and it, the factorization is unique this isn't quite the same as the integers it's unique up to uh, constant rescalings because you could divide one by a half or divide one by two and then multiply another one by by a half for example um, what am I saying you could divide one by two and multiply one by two. Um, so you could rescale factors. So unique up to rescalings of the factors and uh, reordering. And the wonderful thing about this result, as so many of our results at this stage, is that the proof is the same as for integers. What do I mean by the same as for integers? Well, we had the uniqueness of prime factorization of integers. And if you use exactly the step-by-step -step the same proof, you get that this still works here. And that's a, a powerful idea, that there's a strong analogy between the way integers work, which we understand very well, and the way polynomials work over any field. Um, so we have all these different fields we could work over. And we can prove everything all at once for polynomials over any of our fields. And in many cases, we can do it by just saying, well, we already did it for the integers, and it turns out that the proof will work just without, almost without change. Let's try and get more comfortable with this stuff when we apply it to a particular, um, a particular example of a field. And so, uh, as before, we'll work with our field uh, to be remainders, um, remainders mod uh, 2. And just to be very sloppy, I'm going to write those remainders as 0 and 1. I'm not even going to put the bars on them. But we'll understand that we're, since we're working all with the coefficients, which are remainders mod 2, that 2 is, of course, the same as 0. Um, and that means that also, of course, as we said before, that 2x is the same as 0x, which is 0, the 0 polynomial. So the polynomial 2x and the polynomial 0 are, are, are the same polynomial. But the polynomial x is not the same polynomial as 0. So if we look at it that way, then we could take 1 from both sides of this guy also. And we could say minus 1 is the same as 1. Um, I suggest subtracting 1 from both sides of this guy. You get this guy becomes 1, this guy becomes minus 1. So minus 1 and plus 1 are the same, and that's not surprising. Um, that's true mod 2, right? They're, they agree up to a multiple of 2. So, um, so when we ever ha whenever we have a minus sign, it's the same as having a plus sign. Um, so when you have something like minus x cubed plus x minus x squared, you can just get rid of all the minus signs, they all become plus signs. And that makes a lot of calculations easier. So calculations uh, on this, this particular field are usually very, very straightforward, much easier than with ordinary numbers. So let's take an example. b of x is x cubed plus x. And we'll take um, c of x is x squared. Let's see if we can calculate out bazoo coefficients. 
So again, we write uh, as usual in a matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1, and then the B and the C we want to calculate with, and we do step by step on the same old bazoo coefficient calculations. So 1, 0, 0, 1, B of X is X cubed plus X, and C of X is X squared. Now, as always, what we want to do is the bigger degree one is the X cubed. We want to try and divide this into it. And um, so we'd like to take minus X of this to this, so that the minus X times the X squared will give us a minus X cubed, which will kill the X cubed. The, the point, however, is that, of course, minus x is the same as plus x. We've already said that. So, in fact, it'll actually be just x times this row to this row. And that x times x squared gives x cubed. 2x cubed or 0x cubed. And so that's how we'll cancel it out. So it's a little bit easier than, than with the integers. So we're going to add x times this row to this row, giving us 1x and then x. Um, and then the second row stayed the same. And now we're going to um, uh, try to get rid of, we've got an x here and an x squared here, so we want to get rid of the higher degree guy, this x squared. And so we're going to add x times this first row to the second row, um, giving us uh, x times 1 is x. x times x is x squared plus 1. And um, x times x is x squared plus an x squared is 2x squared, which is 0. And the first row stays the same. And now we've got a 0 here, so we know that means that this must be uh, the, the bazoo coefficients and the GCD. And so the bazoo coefficients are 1 and x, and we can say 1 times b of x plus x times c of x equals x. As our, um, uh, that's our GCD. So we calculated out a GCD. These are bazoo coefficients, the 1 and the x times our b of x. Remember, which remember was x uh, cubed plus x. And then c of x was x squared. So we found the GCD between x cubed plus x and x squared. The GCD is x. And, um, and that worked uh, with, with coefficients, which are remainders mod 2. Here's a very elementary result that we'll use frequently. Um, proposition uh, says that... Um, Suppose that P of X is a polynomial over a field. And then any one of our fields, and C is a constant in the field. Then we uh, want to claim that um, P of X has remainder. Remainder equal to P of C when we divide by x minus c. And the proof is actually pretty easy. Um, it's just that um, we can write, uh, we somehow write p of x, well, divide in uh, x minus c into p of x, get a quotient and a remainder, and we don't know what those are. But the, we know that the degree of the remainder, as we said before, the degree of the remainder has to be smaller than the degree of x minus c, which is 1. Degrees of polynomials can't be negative, so this has got to be 0. So the degree of r of x is 0. And that degree 0 means exactly that it has no, no powers of x at all in it, so it's r of x is a constant. And let's write that constant as r of x is some r naught. So now we can write that p of x is somehow x minus c times some unknown quotient plus some unknown remainder number, but it's not a polynomial anymore, it's a remainder number. And now we'll plug in uh, x equals c to both sides, and we get p of c equals c minus c, q of c plus r naught. And this is zero, and so we get r naught is p of c, the remainder is p of c, which is what we had to prove. And as a consequence, we get a, an, an elementary corollary that um, P of X, again, of the same hypothesis, it's over a field, has a root uh, at X equals C, if and only if X minus C divides P of X, because, of course, that the remainder zero. 
some other elementary results. All these, of course, are results you've seen when we worked with real numbers uh, many years ago. When you were young, you worked out all the theory of real numbers, real coefficient polynomials. But it's uh, it's nice to see that everything works pretty much the same in this context with a, with a more abstract notion of field. Um, so every um, our corollary is every polynomial over any field. Uh, has at most at most one factorization of the form a constant times uh, factor x minus r one da 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 dot x minus r n up to reordering. And the proof is simply that um, clearly the ri are the roots. If we had such a factorization, the ri would be the roots. Um, um, so, uh, but on the other hand, if you had a root, then this would have to factor in, um, and so on and so forth. So once you'd factored it enough times, you've reached the degree of the polynomial, and you can't factor it anymore. So that's roughly the proof. And we'll say that a polynomial, um, that a root, sorry, the root has, has um, multiplicity r, uh, multiplicity k, so r not root has uh, multiplicity. It's a root of some polynomial p has multiplicity k if x minus r not to the k is the highest power. So I should say it's a root of some p of x polynomial. It's the highest power dividing into p of x. And again, we get it sort of a trivial observation, which um, it's nice that it holds, though, over arbitrary abstract fields. It's not just for real numbers. Um, as a corollary, the degree of a polynomial over any field is at most uh, the sum of multiplicities of the roots sum of the plus multiplicities of the roots. Because each root gives us a linear factor, the multiplicities tell us how many times that linear factor goes in, and if it, you get too many of them, you hit uh, beyond the degree of the polynomial, it's not going to fit in anymore. It's not going to be able to keep dividing in. Uh, we can also say that we um, the equality uh, here uh, occurs um, to the degree is at most the sum. What if it's equal to the sum? Equality uh, exactly when um, when the, the polynomial is a product of linear factors. Uh, and to prove that, really, you're just using the fact that if you have a linear factor, somehow some ax plus b, you can always rewrite it as dividing out the a x plus b over a, which is a x minus some root minus b over a. It looks like some uh, some root you found this is a root of the po of, of that linear factor. So linear factors give roots, and roots give linear factors. This is a trick that you probably have seen before, and that we're only going to use with the uh, with rational uh, coefficients of, of rational. Uh, we're looking for rational roots. We're working with rational coefficients, um, so uh, so we have a, a lemma that if p of x is a polynomial in one variable uh, over the rational number, so in other words, with rational coefficients, and um, suppose that x equals n over d is a root, all right? As n over d as numerator and denominator, those are n and d are integers, then um, we can say that n has to divide. So the result is n divides um, into the, the coefficient of the lowest term. Ah, sorry. And we'll assume that it's a, it, it will assume that it has integer coefficients to make this work. Um, We'll assume that p actually it's a polynomial over the rationals, but we'll assume that all the coefficients are in fact actually integers. Um, then n divides the coefficient 
of of the um, lowest term and D similarly divides um, the coefficient of the highest term. You, you probably remember the proof. Um, it's, it's not uh, very difficult. Um, we can just write that uh, so proof is if we write out the polynomial in terms of coefficients, and again we assume that they're integers, so it's some a k x to the k plus a k minus one x to the k minus one plus dot 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 plus some a naught. These are its coefficients, which we assumed are, are integers. Now we just plug in. We get p zero is p of n over d is supposed to be a root, so that's zero. Um, a k n to the k over d to the k plus a k minus 1 n to the k minus 1 over d to the k minus 1 to the dot plus a naught. Now what we'll do is just clear denominators. This is a, these are all rational, but they're integer coefficients here, and n and d are integers, so we can make it all into integers by just multiplying everything by d to the k. We clear out all those denominators all at once. We get 0 equals a k n to the k plus a k minus 1 n to the k minus 1 d plus dot 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 plus a naught d to the k. Um, so we've got um, uh, uh, integers entirely here. Now there's, and there's no d here. Uh, we can assume, of course, that n and d are relatively prime. We are co-prime, n and d co-prime, uh, without loss of generality. We can assume they're co-prime. Um, so, or sorry, maybe I should have said that. I should have said that earlier. That they, they would have to be assumed to be co-prime to make this proof work. Um, uh, so, and, and D have to be co-prime. Um, otherwise, the proof doesn't work. Um, so, and then that's always safe because when you have a rational number, you can always uh, you can always rationalize the numerator denominator, cut out any common fra common um, divisor. So we can assume they're co-prime, and then we'll. Um, See, there's no d's in here, but there's d's all the way here. There's lots of d's and d's and d's here. Uh, so if there's no d's here, no d's here, and lots of d's here, um, then d has to divide all this stuff, and it divides 0. So it has to divide there. It can't divide that guy because it's co-prime, so it's got to be sitting in here. So um, d divides a k. And the same works the other way around, that there's lots of n's everywhere except the last guy has no n's in it. Um, and but n divides everybody here, so it has to divide here. It doesn't go into d into the k, so it has to go into the a naught. So it's um, straightforward proof like that, just by clearing denominators. Let's just see this in operation um, on a, on a simple example of a of an actual polynomial. If we looked at um, a polynomial, again, this is over the rational number, so we're going to have rational coefficients. But we said we wanted to actually have integer coefficients for our um, uh, for this uh, polynomial p of x, it's got integer coefficients, and we ask what could n over d be? What could x equals n over d be and be a root? So n and d integers co-prime. Um, so um, how can we find a rational root? Well, n would have to divide um, the um, the lowest term, which is minus one. It's be an integer which divides minus one, so n is plus or minus one, and then d has to divide um, into um, uh, the uh, the coefficient of the x cubed, which is 1. And so d is plus or minus 1. And the ratio of plus or minus 1 over plus or minus 1 is, of course, n over d is plus or minus 1. And therefore, um, you can just check. How do you check? Well, you plug in plus 1 and you plug in minus 1. And they don't work. Neither of them works. And so we get, therefore, that x cubed minus 3x minus 1 has no rational roots. Okay, so it's easy to use this, and we'll u we'll actually use this for um, for other reasons. We'll need to be able to do this kind of this kind of test. We'll be able to find out whether or not various kinds of roots exist for various sorts of polynomials. Polynomials are very important because they're very very simple functions to manipulate, and so naturally we could ask if we're given some sort of data, could we find a way to interpolate it um, using polynomials? In other words, to stick um, a function that somehow go through the required points. 
and yet will be polynomial. Um, so how do we do it? And uh, the surprising thing is we can do it all at once for real, complex, rational, and polynomials for, uh, over um, with, rem uh, with remainders so over a prime all at once. Um, so over any field. Um, if we specify uh, n plus 1 distinct points, so distinct means they're all different from one another, distinct points, x0, x1, dot, 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 x, n. And then we have n plus 1, these are input values, and n plus 1 would say outputs, um, which are also going to be uh, in our fields. These are y1 y to yn. And these are uh, from the field. These are actual constant numbers, from constant values from the field. We're working over some field, as always. Um, so then, um, uh, then there is a unique polynomial. Um, so this is the result. There is a unique polynomial. Uh, some p of x of uh, degree uh, degree uh, equal to n um, that satisfies that p of x naught is y naught of the input value is the output value, p of this input is this output, da, 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 da. p of this input is this output. So you can make it do what you want to do. You can make it, uh, for these different input values, you can get these specified output values. And there's a unique polynomial of degree n that does this. In fact, the, the, the uh, proof is actually fairly similar to the Chinese remainder theorem in that what we're going to do is to um, start off by letting uh, these pj's be the product x minus x naught. We're going to create some pj that has a a one when we plug in some things and a zero when we plug in other things. Um, and uh, so it's going to be x minus x naught, x minus x one, and so on. X minus x j, da, 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 x minus x n. So products, all those possible products. Except we'll cut that one out. And then in the denominator, we do the same thing, but we put like x j's in for the x's. X j minus x naught, x j minus x one. And then the xj minus xj term we don't put in all the way to xj minus xn. Um, because the x's are all different from one another, the denominator is in fact non-zero. It's non-zero. And because we cannot divide in, over any field by anything non-zero, we're safe. So this is a non-zero number because all the x's are distinct, so those are all non-zero. Um, the one that would have been zero we got rid of, so we got rid of those. And so we get pj of x. Um, of x i is zero for i not equal to j because that's going to occur as one of these factors in the in the numerator you're going to get x i minus x i somewhere um, but p j of x j is in fact one because uh, it'll be the numerator and denominator terms will exactly all agree one 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 all the way through and you just get ones and therefore p of x is y not p naught of x plus y1, p1 of x plus dot 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 all the way down to yn, pn of x. We'll do the job. It'll do p of x i is yi. Which you can check because uh, the yi term comes with a, p, uh, with a 1 coming out and the, all the other yj's disappear because the pj's are all 0. Um, and now we could ask, is it unique? Um, so that proves there is one because we wrote it down. Um, is it unique? Um, let's suppose that we have two solutions. Two solutions. Um, let's say some polynomial p of x and some polynomial q of x. They both agree, um, uh, and, and their outputs, they both take these inputs to these outputs. So p of x i is y i, and q of x i is y i. And suppose they also have both have degree n the same degree. Then their difference has to be p of x minus q of x um, has to be also of degree n, but it has to vanish p of x i minus q of x i is zero because they have the same output values at the x i's. They agree at the x i's, so their difference is zero at the x i's. And that implies that x minus x i divides p of x minus q of x, 
for all i, and there are n uh, plus 1 of these, and so um, uh, that's n plus 1 factors in a degree n polynomial. This is degree n, but there are n plus 1 of these, and that's not possible because we'd have to have n plus 1 distinct factors. You'd have to have x minus x naught, da 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 da, x minus x n divides um, p of x minus q of x, which is degree n, and it has n plus 1 linear factors. It's impossible. So in this lecture, um, we've looked at polynomials over arbitrary fields, and we've particularly concentrated on the rational uh, coefficient polynomials, and integer coefficient polynomials, looking for rational roots. But we've also looked a little bit at polynomials uh, whose coefficients are in remainders mod a prime, and we've shown what we can calculate out the bazoo coefficients for them. In the next lecture, we'll look at real and co complex coefficient polynomials, and uh, we'll draw on some results that you uh, should be familiar with from calculus that, that allow us to see um, some more sophisticated results about them, but which we, for which we won't be able to give very many proofs because they're not going to be uh, quite so algebraic.